There's also like so many food shows out there that are very heavily about the food. And we wanted to do something slightly different. Food and the act of preparing it and eating it, it disarms us. And I think there's something very intimate about sharing that with someone. So it's just a perfect playground to explore each other's stories. Hi, I'm Anna Michelle Morejon. Welcome to another episode of Producers Corner. Today is kind of a special episode because we have John and Ivana with us. They are staff members at Metro East. I've yapped a lot about the education side of things, but they are part of the production team. We do fee-for-service video production. They work with clients in the East Portland area, probably a few outside of that. Um, but they're actually here to talk about Food Foray, which is an original docuseries that has been in the work for several years. And I thought it was timely because there's a premiere party coming April 20th um, that's hosted here in our studio at Metro East. So welcome to the show. And if we could just, oh, I should say Ivana is the director, producer, editor, and John is one of the producers and other staff have a hand in this too. We just don't have enough microphones and enough room for the giant crowd of people involved. Um, but yeah, first question for you guys is, can you just give me a little synopsis of what the show is about and the format? Um, yeah, first off, what a beautiful introduction Anna <laughs> Michelle did again. Um, no, yeah, so Food Foray is a, an original docuseries like you mentioned. We have three episodes that we've completed. They're each 20 minutes long. And it's kind of like if you would think about Anthony Bourdain, Parts Unknown, but instead of visiting different countries and exploring culture through food in that way, our host is going to different international grocery stores in the East Portland Gresham area. And they're joined by a special guest from that community. They go through the store aisles, they shop for ingredients, and they kind of demystify the things on the shelves. And then they go to that person's house to cook an authentic dish together and, and then eat with friends and family to discuss anything from geopolitics to immigration to humor to love. And we're really excited about it. And how did this idea come about? So, yeah, John, can well, speak we, to that we, a bit. Well, we had a finance director who had a little bit of time on our hands, uh, Jessica Holiday, and she asked if we ever had spare time and had any ideas for grants. And so Emily had a great idea, one Another of the producer. other producers, um, <laughs> had a great idea about basically engaging with your local grocery store. And so um, when I saw that idea, I kind of parsed it out a little further and kind of joined the three pieces together. And I think the rest is kind of history after that. Yeah, and we just kind of worked on the concept together, and I drew from um, some of my fondest memories in childhood is going to different international, gro international grocery stores with my mom in southwest Portland and Beaverton and just seeing, like, what is this vegetable I'd never seen before? What is this can of, like, purple goop? Like, what are, what are all these things, you know? And it was always really fascinating to me that there were stories behind these kind of uh, foreign objects on the shelves. Yeah, and Jessica Holiday, you know, basically uh, we were going out for a walk and she said, have you ever been to your local Pacific market? And I was like, no. And she said, we're going in and you're buying something. And I had never been in there. It's a massive store. And now I'm in there every week. But it was just right there at my doorstep and I never went in. And I, so part of that evolves into the series of why don't you just go in? So... You know. Now, Pacific Market, you have three episodes. The first one, correct me if I'm wrong, first one's on Georgia. Um, second the, the one, The country. The country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not the state. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Georgia, the country. The second one is on Waka, Mexico. And the third one, Myanmar. Mm -hmm. um, is Pacific Market, which one? No, it's not. It's not, it's in, not. One, it's not in one of those episodes. No. Oh, no. see. But that's, so these three episodes may be our start, and we can talk about that a little bit later, but mm -hmm. can you tell me about how you picked each culture, each type of cuisine and the grocery stores? Yeah, so I think one of the largest challenges for this project was the pre-production end and just finding someone who was would be willing to share their lives with us because it is um it's not just about food we do get into people's personal stories and it's pretty emotive um you kind of it's a, a roller coaster in a way because immigration is difficult for a variety of ways and we really wanted to get to know the people behind these recipes um so it was a challenge finding someone who was comfortable on camera who trusted us and had a rapport with us 
Um, so actually the first person that we filmed for our pilot, her name is Nino. She's from the Republic of Georgia, found her on Facebook, you know, like a cold, like not ca casting call, I guess, if you will, like if anyone is interested in participating and she was a perfect fit. Um, the other, the other next uh, guest is one of our staff members' moms, and we've known for a while that she runs a food cart, a Oaxacan food cart. So um, we got in with her that way, um, Jasmine's mom, Amalia, um, who's just lovely. And Jasmine is one of our hosts, too. So Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. so her face is popping up everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then the third, who's our third? Myanmar. Yeah. And that was via Khan. So a friend of ours at the city of Gresham said, hey, I know, I know Khan. And Khan is a member of the Zomi community or the Myanmar community. And through him, we were able to find our, our third group um, to appear, appear on the show. Now, all of this is, it, it, you know, you're navigating personal relationships, but then we're also just like cold calling stores <laughs> like basically yeah, walking we need the in the store buy-in yeah, too and that yeah. was another challenge that was really tricky um and we we'd get so hopeful and then they'd be like no what? but we we had a really good day one day and we went out and we managed to get supermercado which is from the Oaxacan episode mm -hmm. and then um Mingala Market and Mingala Market so we got we got we eventually and got buy it buy-in but at one stage it was a wee bit like is this ever going to really happen? You yeah, because we needed those two things to align. We really started with who's going to be the guest, and that kind of dictated the culture. And then it was like asking the guests, where do they shop for their the the, the things that they um, need to make their traditional cuisines that can't be found at Albertsons or Safeway or you know those markets. Um, so that's kind of what dictated what cultures we were going to focus on. Yeah, let's talk about the connection between like food and culture. I think there's a lot of ways that you could have approached representing the immigrant, refugee, just diverse community in this area, but to do it specifically through the lens of food, how did that come up? Hmm. Well, East County is not is 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 sometimes uh, seen as being a little bit of a food desert. As in, um, there's not many large grocery stores in the particular, in, like literally in the middle. There's just not a lot of grocery stores. And I had heard years before that um, if you needed to buy halal produce and, and lived in Gresham, I mean, you were having to go south to north and then getting on the bus to go east to west to go into about 120th. So I think a lot of that notion about the food played into it. But it, importantly for us is like this notion of, and I'm going to use this word because I love using it, commensality, which is everything that kind of goes into making the food and then sitting down and having, it's, it's the whole thing. It's this whole conversation, the interactions that happen. You know, there's cultures around the world where the, the women sit around all day and process manioc. They hold the complete political power in that society because they're they're chatting about chatting all the time while they're doing it. So we had this idea of like we really want when they get to the final part of this to eating together to really kind of reveal something about their experience and about their lives. Yeah, and I mean I think inherently food and the act of preparing it and eating it, it disarms us. It brings us back to like our most basic human thing which is like eating and drinking and staying alive and I think there's something very intimate about sharing that with someone so it's just like a perfect kind of playground to explore each other's stories and find what our commonalities are or not and just learn from each other yeah for sure there's this whole like facet of film theory or like film theorists who look at dinner scenes and so I think that's something that you guys really took on is you're not only filming in the grocery stores, but you're figuring out how to capture this authentic conversation at the dinner table. And that's very, on a technical level, that's very hard to do. Um, so yeah, could you tell me a little bit about just the overall production process? Like how many crew members did you have? I love to talk about equipment. So if you know what gear you use, like, yeah, tell me all about it. Yeah. So we, we decided we wanted to work with an outside director of photography, Adolfo Canto Villarreal. 
Um, and he had red cameras that he brought to the team. Nice. Um, so we wanted it. We wanted it to look as cinematic as possible to kind of, I don't know, just make it look polished and something that you would be able to see on Netflix or HBO or Hulu. Um, so he was a core member of our team. And then me, John and Emily were kind of writing, producing, directing, um, pre-production wise. And really like those four people were the main, um, we had Keith as a grip. We had a Keith as another staff yes, member. Yes, another staff member. Um, we had uh, either a PA or an assistant camera, an AC. Angela was, um, Angela Lades Benitez was that, there for a lot of that. And then just PA. So really our crew was under 10 people. Really and then we good. had sound and we yeah. hired sound externally as well. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah, um, we were using lights like you're using mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, and you know, the, the initial piece of the production is like we talked about that previously is like, you know, when we've kind of secured the people, when we've maybe got the venue, the, the market and stuff like that, um, we meet with the, we meet with the market, we meet with the guests and we start to just talk and we start to find out what makes them tick, what they want to bring, what they remember and what, what, what rises to the top. And then we start to develop like, where, oh, where's, where do we want them to talk about that? Or can we have that happen naturally? Yeah, it's a lot of pre-interviews like yeah. pre yeah. and then knowing yeah. what the story is and knowing what the questions are going to be and what we kind of want to talk about ahead of time and then coaching our host. I should mention our host is a lovely, a lovely woman um, named Jess. Well, I guess she, I don't know if she wants her. Her name is Jess. Um, and so just meeting, having her meet with the guests ahead of time. A, a lot of it was in pre-production, truly. Um, and then meeting also seeing the space of where the dinner conversation was going to happen ahead of time was crucial because we were we, we weren't staging like fake homes. We were in the guests' homes, which really varied in terms of size and things like that. So, you know, the last um, the last episode we shot, they, they, they had like a lot of bare walls. You know, we had to dress the living room a lot and bring in some color. Um, and then there was that dinner scene specifically had way more people than um, the previous two because they had a son and they had two roommates. So it was like a six person scene, which we had never done sound or lighting for before. So we um, discussed it with Adolfo and we basically used, what is it, like a, a globe? Okay. Yeah, we just put, we basically put some practicals um, up on the up on the ceiling. Oh, the, no, it's China. China balls with, but yeah. with a special kind of light that we can modify and change the color. Like just on from IKEA, everything. right? Is that what the, we ended up using? Well, the China balls were from IKEA. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the the lamps were from B and H. Right, right. And then we just ended up yeah. hanging that from the center of the table just to yeah. have a natural kind of look. And then we had some natural light coming in from this sliding glass window. And then the odd the audio person just had. I mean, that Moving was, around that a, was lot, a tough because sure. it was like, you know, 30 minute takes. And yeah. so she was having to, um, you know, mix six different audio channels and boom. Oh my and, and also like when we're in the <laughs> when we're in the store to make it really hard you know there's so much refrigeration in grocery stores oh, I didn't think it's about like that. you know yeah. we're, we're taking in these sound blankets and kind of popping them over to kind of deaden the sound yeah that as was we tough go. too because some so, of the stores yeah. are really small yeah but were, definitely they open were people shopping while you were there yeah. oh yeah Oh, yeah. How'd they feel about you being there? You guys have any like funny stories, things that happened but while you're filming? Not really. There's one, I think there's one, I remember seeing one shot in a cut, I don't know if it's still there, and a gentleman kind oh, of totally looks down oh, the aisle and kind of like, that, yeah. you, you know, so, yeah, you know, keep an eye out for that at Mingle There's little market. funny things like that, but you know. But people when, were generally. People, people were generally really great, mm -hmm. you know, and actually some of the people who were just like in the store shopping actually are kind of in there in the yeah. end. So yeah. it was kind of nice to be able to do that. You mentioned the host. I know that's kind of a big part of the series. And we actually had a screening, was it like two weeks ago now? Mm. Um, for like Metro East staff, just as we're polishing it up, preparing for the premiere. And I asked John, I was like, you know, how how do you find the host? And he mentioned something about auditions in the studio. And I, you just, can you tell me that? Tell me a little bit about how you got the host. Well, I mean, I, I wasn't, there for all of that but basically what we did which we thought was was really good fun which was to set up an aisle or two as in like a fake supermarket and actually see how they could come around and kind of look at an object 
and, you know, like pull something off the shelf and then engage with me or whoever was out there with them to just see how they react. <laughs> and just how they would navigate being in like a kind of like go scenario, not just like sitting and talking to someone and how they would vibe and yeah. make like just, you know, make us feel comfortable or not. Yeah, were they like were they good at interacting, and how how did they just riff off a random question, you know? And then yeah, it was a lot of well, I shouldn't say it was a lot of fun for us. Yeah, <laughs> did you guys film that too, or was yeah, we okay. had those. Wow, on a you got some outtakes. for protected Vimeo. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe I'll try to yeah, you should to hunt them down. <laughs> yeah, I will say, and we really love Jess because she just brought. So, a really unique energy to it and she is high energy and we and she kind of uh she shined on camera in a way and she has made since filming these three episodes super genuine connections with all three guests like she's coming at it from a very um genuine place which i think shows um especially in the dinner scenes so um yeah we're happy to have her mm -hmm. yeah watching it i really felt like having Jess, it just, it carried each episode through. I mean, um, Jess has her own experience. Is she biracial? She comes from different yeah. backgrounds. And so, mm -hmm. and also is a self-described foodie. So yeah. seeing her interact and just like almost as like a stand-in for the viewer. Watching that was a huge surprise for me because when you hear about the, you know, it's like a journey, a food journey through East Portland, I think food, you know? And so I remember at our screening, I was, I was very happily caught off guard by that emotional aspect. And so, yeah, maybe you guys could talk a bit about that. Was there always an intention to get to a deeper place? Yeah, what, what was the balance between the lightheartedness of food and shopping and then also those heavy hitting deep conversations? Um, I Personally, I love creating that balance in a lot of work that I do, like the goofy, lighthearted humor, you know, side and then, but really getting real as well and cutting through surface things and asking the questions that really make you kind of think. Um, so that's, that dinner part was kind of what I was most passionate about. Like, yes, I love food and all this kind of stuff too, but like that's, that's for me, that's what I was really clinging on to because I am curious about what, uh, what perspective someone from the Republic of Georgia that, f you know, that collapsed under communism has now living here in this country. Like, I'm curious about what um, someone from Oaxaca, Mexico thinks about the cuisine here and life here, you know, like I just, I, I want, I personally wanted to know. And, um, I guess I, I can also say that I'm from, I'm originally a refugee to this country. I'm from the former Yugoslavia, Bosnia. So a lot of my work is just exploring this immigrant experience. Cause I don't have very many people directly in my community here that I know. So I kind of identify with just immigrants as a collective and just, um, love the outside perspective on a culture that we think like we're so ingrained in and kind of having their perspective bring us out and um, kind of like unlearning what these things are that were around and kind of re, re I guess recreating like what, what, what it is that we really believe if it's challenged. But I think we knew like going into like certainly the first episode, um, Georgia, um, that as we went through the days of production, we knew that when it came to the dinner scene, we really wanted Jess to bring some of herself into that. And so we, we kind of worked quite hard toward making that kind of happen and like giving some prompts and giving some ideas and trying to, you know, just say there will be a place for you to say some of these things, so don't don't hold back on that. I want to jump in on something Ivana said about the immigrant piece because, you know, I'm a card-carrying, you know, green card holder, and so I think that when we met with some of the people for the first time and we actually had that revelatory moment with them when we were like, neither of us was born here, they were kind of like, oh, you know, there was a little bit of a like, oh, I think if I understand you a little better now, or, or yeah, we can go we can talk about this more. So I think that was a nice a nice thing that we were able to, to bring, right. certainly. And I think there's also like, you know, so many food shows out there that are very heavily about the food. And we wanted to do something slightly different. Mm. 
Yeah, I think you achieved that so beautifully. Um, and you can see that there's trust and obviously vulnerability in every episode. And that's very hard to do when you have a giant crew, when you have all the lights you're talking about. So I really applaud you guys on that. Like, I'm so excited for Food for A to come out. What? Where can we see it? Tell me a bit about your distribution. What's your strategy or plan there? Yeah, so that's... Um we're still working on it. Um, we are, aren't even technically done with post production oh, yet. Yeah. We're very mm -hmm. close. We're having. We're gonna have picture lock <laughs> by next week. Um, but yeah, for distribution, you know, we are talking to OPB right now. Hopefully, kind of collaborating with them. We're talking about doing a couple more community screenings here and there. Looking into film festivals that have an episodic category and kind of seeing if we meet anyone that way, like a buyer. I mean, our dream would be to have it on HBO or Hulu or Netflix. Um, Definitely, you know, eventually broadcasting it on our channels. We are Metro East um, and making it available to the wider audience somehow. We just need to find the right platform and the right um, the right channel to really make it thrive. Because I think a lot of filmmakers put in a lot of work on the front end and then they're exhausted and when the distribution comes and then there's no marketing, there's no distribution. It kind of just gathers dust on some URL um, and we don't want that to happen. I think you kind of said when we did that kind of like small screening just to kind of get everybody's feelings about it. I mean, that was really interesting. The results of that, um, you know, that emotionality piece and how that storytelling piece was all working. And, you know, yeah, I think that's really important. And hopefully, you know, we'll get some more of that kind of vibe and that will really help us like propel it forward into distribution because we'll have a a much better sense of like, you know, not just like 20 people really liking it, but it'll be, you know, yeah. it's just. We are, you know, having a community screening on the 20th of April. It's gonna be a big party, you know, it's open to the general public for that event specifically. We're hoping to bring a lot of press in. Like we're hoping to get the Portland Mercury, the Willamette Week, we got the Gresham Outlook and just trying to, oops, trying to create a buzz around it. Um, and see where that takes us. There's no direct path with distribution, which is kind of nerve wracking, but you know, just doing what we can to get to get it out there and seeing seeing what happens from that. Yeah. Sounds like the prospects are great. You know, we are cable channels, OPB, Oregon Public Broadcasting. That's that. Yeah, I would love independent lens would be cool. Oh my goodness. Yes. See independent here? lens. So that's a, a PBS series. Mm -hmm. And the film festivals too. I think this it's a type of thing that this I'm trying is, sorry, to take. Guys, this is like falling. It did feel as if it was sliding down. Yeah, we can adjust our mics. I think. Can you just tighten it for me from that end? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I think this is. It's nice because you have the entertainment aspect, emotion for sure, but also education and. A lot of people will shudder at the word education, but it's really intricately woven in there. And I think that speaks to the, the pre-production that you guys did, those mm -hmm. interviews, the the scripting, the, the nudges of like, hey, let's talk about this. I learned a lot watching the series. And so a lot of people would benefit, especially people in um, East Portland. Do you have a specific audience in mind? Um, well, so the the beauty of having this be this multifaceted thing, we got the grocery stores, we've got the cooking segment, we've got the dinner conversation. So we're hoping to get, you know, people who are just into food programming, maybe people who are just into kind of like exploring different cultures, and then bringing both of those sides to each other. So I, I don't know, I think like, food enthusiasts and anyone c curious about I don't know, doc, intercultural documentary. Um, yeah, I mean, I think food enthusiasts is definitely for sure. And it's it because there's that uniqueness to it, it's not a straightforward like kitchen show or it doesn't follow any particularly known playbook. Mm -hmm. I think that will just, when, when a food enthusiast watches this and gets into this emotional piece and the relationship piece, they'll actually see something that's greater than, than, than they've seen before. And I'm, I'm hope that hopefully that. Yeah. Which is always, yeah, which was always our hope, you know, using food as the starting point to launch us into this whole other thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I've really harped on the uh, 
the kind of like relational aspect, the conversations, but food is a big part of it. I mean, there's these beautiful shots of the food, like make your mouth water, close-ups, the food being prepared in the oven, you know, across all three episodes. So for the food enthusiasts, there is a lot in there. And, and that was an, that's kind of like a, I don't, byproducts, the wrong word, but I mean, that was quite unusual when, you know, we had the first episode and it's like, ooh, yeah. That food does look nice, you know, and it's not being sprayed and it's not yeah. being coated and it's not being through all those processes of food photography. I mean, this is this is real. And so it was really nice that you draw attention to that, because I think food enthusiasts, when they see how beautiful these things are, it's only just going to make and just, them want yeah. more. And just unique. I mean, like we have Nino's mom in the first episode squeezing ground walnuts with her hands to get the walnut oil out for a recipe. Like, I've never seen that, mm -hmm. you know? Like, there's just so many interesting things. Or, like, I never thought a radish soup could taste as phenomenal as it does. So it's just a lot of things I've never seen before. Or, like, using, um, like, a meat grinder to make beet salad, putting beets through this meat grinder. You know, it's just, like, really um, interesting ways of preparing dishes that I personally have never seen. So I think other people would be interested by it, too. And I, I mean, I was fascinated by Oaxacan ep episode and the food preparation, mm. um, you know, because of, like, there's the cactus that needs to, you know, needs to have the spines taken off it. And then there's the, the gua, is it the guaje? Yeah. You know, and we have to take the seeds out. It's just like the processes to me as former kitchen person were fascinating. So I, I kind of, when I see that like coming to life, I'm kind of like, oh, there's something for, you know, that group of people, you know. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by former kitchen person? You can't just throw former that in there and person? not elaborate. He was hoping you would ask. Oh, yeah, that was, that was just <laughs> my a little. Former kitchen that was a plan. <laughs> that was my little drop for you. Thank you for picking up on that, Anna Michelle Moron. I picked up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, fully trained, qualified as a chef when I was like like straight out of what you would all call high school um didn't quite have the prospects but and then on and off for I don't know 14 years after that I mean it got me through college like <laughs> cooking and tending and doing all, doing all that stuff so yeah and yeah. it's remarkable because he's talked about this uh, since I met him maybe six, seven years ago, and he's still never cooked me anything. So it's really interesting. So even, even when no I had proof. a baby, you know, and uh, people were delivering meals, st still waiting on that. John. Yeah. Well, you know, but that's the point that you can surprise somebody truly in the future. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up, Ivana. So maybe, you know, at this community screening. I ought to bang out a couple of dishes for 100 people. You should be doing the cooking. Yeah, well, maybe I will. Maybe I'll just make You're some the nice. the support. Maybe yeah. we should have the cooking come from the, the people but, who should know, be cooking like their the, meals. The, but... the joke is, is there actually going to be a Scottish episode? And I don't think we could quite manage that. Well, so speaking of that, <laughs> are there plans for future episodes? <laughs> there are. I mean, we have a participant from Syria who's interested, um, a guest from Nepal who's interested, and we have a store, um, a Syri like a mm -hmm. Syrian store that's interested too. So we have potential, we have ideas for future episodes. Right now we're in the mode where we need to find funding for future episodes. So one of the asks at this uh, community screening is gonna be, you know, if people feel, feel inspired, here's a QR code you can donate to, you know, for the future of Food Foray. Um, we're also doing a lot of grant writing and things like that. So if the funding comes, we've, we're gonna run with it. I mean, I, my hope is to make at least three more. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Six is a solid number. Yeah. I mean, the season orders are getting shorter and shorter. It's like eight to 10 episodes, you know, six, you know, you're in there. You're in there. Um, and I'll link in the podcast description. We'll have more information on Food for Ray and a link where you can donate to if you're listening to this. We love the support. And I was going to ask you. Yeah. I'd love to say a little bit more about the community screening on April 20th. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I'm really excited about it. Oh, so me too. Our, um, our vision, it's going to be two to five on April 20th. And our vision is to screen all three episodes. But instead of just like sitting people down and having them watch a 20 minute episode followed by another, we're going to have like, all right, everybody, first episode, Republic of Georgia. Here we go. And then we screen the episode. We have a Q&A so people get an, uh, the chance to kind of ask more film behind the scenes questions of John and I, but also Nino and her mom 
anything culturally specific that they want clarified from them and kind of hopefully create some interesting discussions that way. And then we're going to have the DJ play like Georgian music and we're going to try food as seen in the episode. So in that episode specifically, we um, feature babushka, Russian deli and bakery. So we're going to have cake from um, what we see at the grocery store. And then it's like, all right, everybody, now it's time to go to Oaxaca, Mexico. And we'll watch the episode, do a Q&A. And we'll actually have Amalia, um, who's featured in the episode, cater and serve people tastes of what she cooked in the episode. So it's kind of like... she's a food truck, so... Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, And same thing for the third episode with me and Mar. Stefan, our main guest there, is going to be making some radish soup and we'll be um, giving samples of Burmese tea leaf salad. So it's just really interesting to, you know, spend 20 minutes in this world and then actually get to try the Mm. food. Um, And then after the Mexico episode as well, we're going to have a live live music by by a Mexican and Bolivian artist. So we're hoping to make it just like a whole a whole thing, right? Music, food, da- maybe dancing, who knows? Discussions. Um. John can lead the, the front on the dancing, right? Well, Absolutely. Yeah. You know me. You know me. That's the plan, the big dance party at the end. But you know what's most exciting to me about this concept is the fact is like you're going to be able to watch the movie and potentially smell the food that's in it at the same 4D. time. Isn't that a thing? 4D? It could be. I don't know what that is. 4D is like, you know, they say 3D, and then 4D is like the augmented experience of right, like right, they're right. splashing water at you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have the smells. So 4D. John, John you're leading people astray. I, he said this to me the other day, too, and I couldn't tell if he was kidding or not. And I still am not sure. So like, stay tuned the, for the 4D. Yeah. You're just going to have to find out. I'll be at the back with a, a, a single baguette. burner wafting. You're just going to have to come and find out. <laughs> All right. Well, um, where can people find Food for Ray online? Like for just to have it in the episode, we'll put it in the description. But um, where can people go to learn more? We have a tab on our website, uh, metroeast.org. And under the production services tab is a yeah. Food for a link. You could also Google Metro East Food for a, and it should be the first thing that pops up. And in there, you'll kind of see more information about the show. You'll see a trailer. And you'll see a link to where to get tickets for this event. And it's a suggested donation. So if you don't want to pay, we're, we'd love to have you anyway. Yeah. And there will be food and drinks. Oh, yeah. Well. Drinks, yeah. too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't forget the drinks. And I do want to – I just – I thought of one more thing that's, like, really unique Go about ahead. this show that I'm kind of passionate about. You know, we think of – We think of Portland and it's like obviously one of like the nation's strongest food cities, right? Portland, Oregon is known as like was rated the best food cart scene in the world. Like over Thailand, we just got like rated like the best pizza over New York. You know, it's like a big foodie city. But the thing that Gresham and East Portland have that Portland doesn't is that authentic, authentic, authentic dishes because... Um, I guess we haven't mentioned that East County, it's it's the most diverse zip code in all of Oregon. So, so many refugees and immigrants are resettled in these in this area, um, more so than, you know, in Portland proper. So there's a lot of like these smaller, less well-known, less developed shops and food carts and these kinds of things out here. Um, so I think that authenticity um, is just very unique to this place and Food Foray kind of points to that. Um, Because, you know, some of our guests, they've only been in the States for two years. So they're bringing with them like a fresh, like this is how I cooked three years ago in my country. Um, So I think that's that's worth mentioning, kind of exciting. Yeah. I'm so excited for people to see it. And I'm so happy we were able to have you guys on the show. It just was a spur of the moment. I really was like, hmm, it would be cool to have you guys on. So I'm happy we did it. Um, So again, John, Ivana, Anna Michelle Morejon, this was Producers Corner. And on Producers Corner, we have tried to spotlight content creators in East Multnomah County. So this is perfect um, and representing like wider East Multnomah County for food. And all of our episodes are produced by an educational cohort who are getting hands-on production experience. So I have to shout them out because the work they're doing is incredible. Each episode, it's getting like stronger and stronger. We always have some like technical things we have to figure out. That's just the nature of how things go. But I'm super impressed with how things are going. And so that's our own little production feat here is Producers Corner. So if you liked this podcast please follow us like it give it a review wherever you're listening and check out our past episodes and future ones so thanks for tuning in and we'll see you on the next episode 
Thank, Thank you. you.